All right, so this implementation is not even available until SQL Server 2016 when Microsoft made availability groups possible for standard edition. When, um, when availability groups were introduced in SQL Server 2012, you can only do so with Enterprise Edition, and this prevented a lot of customers who were running Standard Edition with database mirroring from even upgrading. And that's because they have to give up the Standard Edition licenses and move up to Enterprise Edition just to take advantage of availability groups. And of course, not to mention having Active Directory, DNS, and failover clustering. And there are restrictions. For one, you can only add one database per availability group in the standard edition uh, implementation. Some people think this is a good idea because they're cutting down on licensing cost. And when, when you start to think about trying to cut down on the initial cost and not simply looking at the overall cost, you're missing the bigger picture. Why is that? Well, for one, if you go back to some of the lessons that we've covered in the Windows Server Failover Clustering Fundamentals, um, in the always on availability group fundamentals, every availability group will have its own resource group in the failover cluster. Every listener name will have its own virtual computer object in Active Directory and a corresponding DNS record with a corresponding virtual IP address on a DNS server. If you have 25 databases on your SQL Server instance, that's a lot of Active Directory objects a lot of DNS records, a lot of virtual IP addresses, and a lot of resource groups to manage on your failover cluster. Okay, So think about the overhead, the management overhead, the administration overhead, the troubleshooting overhead that entails. That's one. Number two, because these are independent availability groups, there's nothing stopping SQL Server from triggering an automatic failover because we have database level health detection. There's nothing stopping SQL Server from failing over one of the availability groups to the secondary replica. Well, when you start to think about the licensing impl implications of that, the reason why you wanted to run standard edition is because you want to cut down on licensing costs. With SA, your secondary replica is free so long as you don't run anything on top of that secondary replica. Of course, with the new licensing uh, changes in SQL Server 2019 software assurance, you can run CheckDB, you can run backups, and that's fine. But the minute that you start running an availability group on that secondary replica, you now have to pay for license. So when you start to think about that, you could potentially pay both replicas with licenses. Instead of saving on licensing costs because you want that to be standby, you now have to think about what about when I start running availability groups? And of course, there are, there are workarounds there, um, which I'm also going to show you. But again, don't think that just because you want to save on licensing costs, basic availability groups is the way to go. Think of the overall administration overhead maintenance cost throughout the life cycle of the application, in this case, SQL Server. I'm running uh, SQL Server 2017 here, although this, of course, was introduced in SQL Server 2016. Uh, the version, so long as it's 2016 and higher, doesn't really matter. The thing that I really want you to pay attention here is the standard edition, which means it will definitely block me from um, adding more than one database in the AG. Plus, I'm also using instance, uh, named instance in here. Um, if you want to build an availability group using named instances, the names of the instances across all replicas should be the same, regardless of edition. Standard, enterprise, it has to be the same. All right? So I'm going to use the wizard to build an availability group here. And again, just to show you, it's easy. Doing it is easy. But the overhead of, again, management, administration, troubleshooting in the future would add up overall. Okay. I'm going to use the wizard, create a new availability group. And I am, I'm going to call this AdventureWorks for the AdventureWorks database. AG. I'm going to use the database level health detection. And uh, my AdventureWorks database 
is available. Notice that I already have databases in here that were joined to an availability group. And notice as well that when I checked that box beside AdventureWorks database, the other checkboxes were grayed out. In fact, if I click on one of these, right, nothing, right? If I add this, it will tell me um, this one. It says a database is already selected. Only one database can be added to a basic available group. And uh, this is, again, the, one of the limitations when you create an available group using standard edition. Of course, in addition to having many available groups, each one with its own listener name and a virtual IP address. But I'm going to show you that later. OK, click Next. Of course, with basic, you can only have two replicas. The minute that I add a new replica, all of a sudden the add replica button gets uh, grayed out, which means I can't add any more replicas. I only have two. That's another limitation of a standard edition uh, availability group. I'll leave the listener later. Okay, I just want to make sure that this part is done properly. I'm going to use automatic seeding. Uh, database. Oh, database already exists. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to join it. That, that, and done. Again, creating a basic availability group is easy. But just because it's easy doesn't mean this is something that you have to implement. We have an availability group. And if you notice, I got a ton of them already. Two, three, four. This is the ninth, or I think the tenth one. My availability group is healthy. And here's the thing I only have one database in here. My dashboard now is restricted to only the database, the availability group that it covers. Which means if I need to start monitoring, and like I said in the beginning, the overall management administration overhead that involves working with this because now I don't have a single pane of, pane of glass to look at all of the databases in my AG. I'll have to look at every single one of them. Okay. So this is what I wanted to show you really. I've got like a ton of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten availability groups, each one with its own listener name and virtual IP address. Listener name, virtual IP address. So if somebody's managing your failover cluster, they're like, whoa, now they have a ton of resource groups to manage in, on top of the failover cluster. What about your Active Directory, guys? Well, I'm going to open up my Active Directory users and computers here. And now if you start to look at this, I'm going to refresh this. I got a ton of these. All of these were created because of my basic availability groups. Every single one of those will have a virtual computer object. And mind you, there is a limit by default to the number of computer accounts that you can create in Active Directory. By default, that's 10. Okay. What if you have 25 databases? Now you have to ask your AD administrators to inc increase that quota in order for you to continue to create virtual computer objects in Active Directory. What about the DNS? Well, if you look at this, I've got a ton of listener names with their corresponding DNS records and their virtual IP addresses. Your DNS administrator will also start freaking out with us. We're not even done yet. Let me log into the machine, the one that is currently running as the uh, primary replica. And I want to display the IP address assignments. Oops, wrong machine. Whoa, look at that. I wanted I want you to look at the Ethernet adapter LAN. This is the public network adapter that we use to connect to this machine. 
The 172.16.0.11 is the physical IP address of the machine. The 172.16.0.18 is the virtual IP address of the failover cluster's cluster name object. And there we go, 171, 172, 173, 174, 175, up to 179. We have not even added the virtual IP address of the AdventureWorks database availability. Your server admin will start to freak out when he starts to see this because now the management, the tracking of the IP address and so on and so forth. Again, the management overhead that this entails. And as I was mentioning earlier, right, there's nothing stopping SQL Server from triggering an automatic failover of one of the databases if, let's say, you know, something went wrong, the log file of the uh, the log file of one of the databases becomes corrupted, which can trigger an automatic failover based on the database level health detection policy. So let's say, right now, the owner node for every single one of those AGs is TDPRD011. And maybe something triggered a failover, and now you see the Northwind-AG, the availability group for the Northwind database. The owner node is now on TDPRD012. Now you're violating your licensing agreement if you only have software assurance to cover this. And a lot of people have uh, done a couple of workarounds here. For one, instead of having multiple listener names, one for each um, availability group, what they did is they only have one listener name for all. Meaning, they'll create an availability group with no uh, listener name and only one availability group will have a listener name. Which means, you know, it's just like having an availability group in an enterprise edition configuration, uh, one listener name for all of the databases. But of course, that's technically how it works, but it emulates having one listener for all of the databases. The problem with that, again, is you have to constantly monitor whether you have all of your availability groups or in the concept of a failover cluster, all of your roles or resource groups in the same node. What about if you haven't? So this is an example of a PowerShell script where you could check. And I'm using a simple PowerShell command here. Get cluster. It's going to connect to the uh, failover cluster's cluster name object and it will get the cluster group. In this case, uh, it is going to check all of the, um, let's run this uh, one portion at a time so you can see exactly what the output is. Here it will display all of the uh, cluster resource group. Notice the PowerShell command that says cluster group. That's why I still like calling it resource groups. And if you notice one of the, re well actually two because you see available storage, but we don't really have um, shared storage here. But if you look at the Northwind-AG, the owner node is TDPRD012. Let's include another parameter here or a where filter. And uh, filter that out. If you notice, um, I got two, but I'm only, only really concerned about the Northwind-AG. It's running on TDPRD012. What you can do is you can then use the move cluster group PowerShell command. This will pipe the output of the previous command that we had and it will move those resources over to the other node. We can only have like two nodes, or rather two replicas in an AG. So this will force the failover. But one thing I don't really like about failovers is that the failover is an outage. So your transactions, long running uh, queries, they are gonna get rolled back and terminated. That's why I don't really like this. And I've seen people uh, use either SQL Server agent jobs to run a PowerShell command to do this. But again, just to guarantee that all of the resource groups are in one node. Not a big fan of a failover. We are 
trying to minimize failovers because we want to minimize outages. And again, nothing is stopping SQL Server from triggering an automatic failover if something goes wrong with a database. So you really have to uh, think about that. Is this worth you know, pissing off your Active Directory guys, uh, adding more work to your DNS guys, your network guys, your failover clustering guys, your Windows guys, just because you want to save on SQL Server licensing. Again, it's very straightforward to do. There are some limitations, but beyond the limitations, it's really the overhead of managing, uh, administering, monitoring, troubleshooting issues down the road. There is a document below that you can follow to build your own environment. In this case, you can build a four node Windows Server failover cluster, but you can only really add two replicas in an AG. So make sure that you really have to think about the, uh, uh, the overall maintenance uh, cost throughout the life cycle of the application. Most uh, ISVs and um, application vendors recommend this because it's they think oh I'm the only database our application is the only database that we can run on uh, an AG and that's one of the reasons why they recommend it again think about the overall administration maintenance operations troubleshooting cost down the road and not just the initial licensing cost to implement this